Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, as some of you will know, I am the collections officer for the Archive and Library at Yorkshire Museum and have been in post for just over five years. I've been working in museums um, for over 25 years now, and during that time, although my focus has been on object collections, particularly archaeological, people have always been a key part of the story. But who found it, who made it, how did people use it, who lived there, and what did people talk or write about? Anyway, enough about me. This evening, I'm going to talk to you about two early 19th century bound letter books containing over 520 letters addressed to William Cunnington I from nearly 60 correspondents, which are in the museum's nationally significant archive and library collection. I'm going to give an overview of the books, explain how we went about getting them conserved during a pandemic and what we have been doing since they were returned to the museum. But first, I thought I should explain who William Cunnington I was for those of you who don't know. He was born in 1754 and lived in Hatesbury, a village outside Warminster in Wiltshire, where he started his working life as an apprentice draper. However, he is more known as an antiquarian and archaeologist. Following his doctor's orders to ride out or die, he regularly rode across Salisbury Plain. He was particularly interested in the ancient burial mounds he saw in the landscape, and over a period of seven years, with the support of aristocrat Sir Richard Colt Hall, he opened 465 barrows in Wiltshire, including Bush Barrow. The spectacular finds from this barrow are displayed in the museum's prehistoric gallery. So to the books, what exactly am I talking about? Well, I thought I should first explain what a letter book is, and this is the best definition that I have found so far. Letter books were used to keep copies of letters which were sent and received by a person or in other instances, they were collections of copies of historic letters which were available, copies of published letters and letters written by famous people. In our case, the two letter books are a collection of letters received by William over a period of 12 years by a large number of people. It is not known when the letters were bound together forming these letter books, but it was probably during the 19th century. Within the archive, we have a large collection of 18th and 19th century antiquarian papers, documents, notebooks, sketches and correspondence, once belonging to notable individuals or antiquarians, including William Stukeley, John Britton, John Audrey, Aubrey, Canon John Edward Jackson, Sir Richard Colthaw, and William Cumming Cunnington, to name but a few. These collections are a unique resource for those researching the archaeology and history of Wiltshire. As ideas and knowledge were shared, friendships were created, and the best way for these men to stay in touch with each other was by writing letters. The lengths of these letters range from one page to six pages, and many wrote to each other at length about a new theory or what such and such had found. Sadly, we do not have many copies of the letters written by William Cunnington himself in response, so it is a bit one-sided, but nonetheless, they are a fascinating glimpse into the thinking and goings on during the late 18th and early 19th century. To put these letter books into context, Sir Richard Colthaw financed William Cunnington to excavate ancient sites on his Stourhead estate and environs, including the first Stonehenge excavation in 1798. The letters provide a backdrop to his excavation work, and many ideas discussed on these pages were fundamental in developing the groundbreaking publication of Ancient Wiltshire, published between 1812 and 1819. So now I'm just going to give a, an overview of each letter book. Letter book one is a bound, was I should say, a bound letter book holding 246 handwritten letters dated 1799 to 1810. The letters are all addressed to William Cunnington and discuss primarily um, archaeological matters. The letters complement the museum's archaeological collections as many objects described are displayed in the museum's prehistoric gallery. 
this is what they look like before conservation. The letters themselves are from five individuals in book one. Sir Richard Colt Hall, antiquarian, archaeologist, artist, and in his youth, a keen traveller. Henry Penruddock Wyndham was an MP, topographer and author. Archdeacon William Cox, a historian and priest. Abraham Crocker, a surveyor, cartographer, printer, and master of the Blue Coat School at Froome. And Philip Crocker, surveyor and draftsman and son of Abraham Crocker. Now, letter book two is similar, but different. Again, it's a bound volume of, was a bound volume of 277 letters dated 1798 to 1811 of approximately 400 pages. Like book one, the letters are addressed to Cunnington, but this time the correspondence is more conversations between an antiquarian and his contemporaries discussing and developing ideas on geology, natural science, archaeology, um, proofing and amending each other's published works and creating their own collections. Occasionally, there is a sketch or a drawing included of uh, a landscape view or an object, such as the bead you can see at the bottom on the right hand side of the slide. They also discuss their ailments and travel arrangements, just like we do today. This letter book has letters from 54 different correspondents. And the, these are just a few of those that um, are included. So John Britton, the antiquarian, topographer, author and editor, Reverend Edward Duke, antiquarian and later magistrate, Reverend James Douglas, a cloth merchant, a military engineer, antiquarian and author, Alima Bork Lambert, a botanist, William Martin, a naturalist and paleontologist, Reverend Thomas Lehman, an antiquarian and gene genealogist, James Sowerby, a naturalist, illustrator, and mineralogist. Matthew Bolton, an industrialist. William Smith, a geologist. And Edward Fenton, an, an archeologist. And these are just names of a few of them. Many of the ideas discussed in these letters made a significant impact on the development of science and archeology span in the 19th century and are exceptional historic importance. It is rare for a detailed correspondence amongst antiquarians and collectors at this time to survive. So why did they need to be conserved? The museum has a care and conservation plan and both of these letter books were listed as a top conservation priority. The letters were bound in an acidic hardcover, probably done in the late 19th century. The original bindings were also failing resulting in the letters becoming loose from the spine, which was also badly damaged. The letters themselves were on acidic paper and the inks used were starting to bleed and blur the handwriting. Therefore, the letters needed to be dehacidified. By this I mean put into a bath of alkaline solution to remove or reduce the acids in the paper and thus extending the letter's life expectancy. The letters also needed to be cleaned the surface dirt removed and some letters needed to be repaired and old repairs removed. Many letters had writing really close to the paper's edge, which was once curled, tatty and torn, and the writing was at risk of being damaged and lost. There was also damage along the folds and where, and where wax seals had been removed. All the letters needed their edges to be strengthened and to do all this, they needed to be removed from the original bindings. All 523 letters have been glued to paper guards and at one point in the past some letters have been glued onto backing sheets and patches of these backing sheets have been left behind and were covering things like names and addresses. In some cases iron gall ink had been used and the acidic compound in the ink had corroded through the paper. So what all this amounted to was that if they were not stabilised and treated soon, they would continue to deteriorate slowly due to the acidity of the paper. 
Now, as you can imagine, all this conservation was going to cost a lot of money. So we decided to conserve one book at a time and apply for grants to help pay for the work. Book one was conserved in 2020 with a grant of £5,000 from the Association of Independent Museums and the Pilgrim Trust. The remaining £1,660 was raised by a museum member's appeal. It took three months to conserve by Lancefield Conservation and was ready to collect the week before we entered the first lockdown. However, the book was not collected by me until October 2020, six months later, because I and other collection staff were furloughed. Book two was conserved two years later in 2022, thanks to a grant of £2,364 from the National Manuscript Conservation Trust and £6,280 from legacies by former museum members. Again, Lancefield Conservation did the work and the book was back in the museum by April 2022. So what did they do? Before starting uh, treatment, the number, uh, the numbering of letter of each letter was checked and any anomalies noted, such as letters numbered twice, letters not numbered exact, etc. Photo I've gone too far, sorry. That's better. The letters were carefully removed from the paper guards. Any self-adhesive tape was removed, including any remaining residue from the sticky tape surface. Loose items were noted, removed and stored to one side. Any letters with coloured ink were treated with bookkeeper deacidification spray, which is a water-free formula that neutralises the acid in paper. These inks can be fugitive and therefore could not have any moisture treatments. The rest of the letters were washed in an alkaline solution to deacidify. This washing process also allows the remnants of the old paper guards and patches of old backing paper to soften and be removed. When dry, the letters were repaired, the fine archival tissue and wheat starch paste. Where appropriate, missing parts were filled in with suitably toned paper. Once the repairs were dry, the excess tissue was trimmed and the letters given a light press to remove the worst of the creases. The letters were then returned to their original order and scanned to provide a digital copy, thus reducing the need to handle the originals in the future. Once the letters had been scanned, they were put into made to measure archival polyester sleeves. The sleeves allow the letters to be stored flat and to provide protection from our naturally oily fingers while still allowing them to be viewed and will protect the letters for future generations to research and enjoy. Custom size clamshell ring binders were then made to hold the collection of letters. They were made using a very robust spe specification, which consists of a hard wearing water resistant buck ram fabric on the outside over double thickness millboards and a black paper lined linen cloth was used for the linings. The covers of the bindings have gold lettering tooled onto the upper surface, which reads letters addressed to William Cunnington. This is then followed by the name of the correspondent for the letters in book one. For example, letters addressed to William Cunnington from Sir Richard Colt Hall, or on the book two binders, the gold letters read letters addressed to William Cunnington, 1798 to 1810, B to H, i.e. all those letters from people with surnames beginning with B to H. The letters were then placed inside the binders in their protective sleeve in the same order they were originally bound in the old books. In total, both letter books took just over six months to be conserved and cost a total of £15,304. Having described the books and the conservation work carried out, I thought I should tell you what we've been doing with the letter books since they had arrived, since they have arrived back in the museum. Previously, the letters had been catalogued several times on paper 
an on a word document, but not into a searchable collections database like modes, which you can see here. Before there had been one general record for each book, which included a basic summary of its contents. Now, thanks to Helen Meikle, an MA student from Bar Spa University, who undertook her course placement with us last year, there is now a detailed record for each letter on the database. Each record has a summary of the contents of the letter, including who it is written by, the date, and the names of anyone else mentioned. The record also includes key words or subjects discussed, the dimensions of the letter, how many pages, and where it is stored, i.e. which store, what shelf, and what uh, ring binder box the letter is in. So thanks to Helen's excellent cataloguing skills, we now have 534 records entered into modes, and attached to each record are the scans of the pages of the relevant letter. This means we can now search the collection far easier. For example, if searching for a specific topic like geology, or perhaps a person like John Britton, and therefore answer inquiries much more efficiently. In the long term, it also means that it will be easier to share these letters online through the museum's online database. Linked to Helen's placement, she decided to use the antiquarian letters for her MA dissertation. Her dissertation was, um, the title of her dissertation was William Cunnington, Pastimes and Livelihoods, Cataloguing, Concept Development, Research and Exhibition Plan. So whilst transcribing and cataloguing the letters in the second letter book, Helen drew together an exhibition plan surrounding William Cunnington and the interconnecting world of men, of the men in his letters his work and his pastime in geology. Helen chose to focus on the year 1808 because it was the year William Cunnington conducted his excavations on the Bush Barrow. And there was a lot of geological discussions occurring in the correspondence, possibly because the Geological Society had been founded the year before in 1807. Four correspondents were selected and a number of their letters were transcribed. The letters suggested the men were keeping collections of geology and swapping their some samples with one another several years before the foundation of the Geological Society. The title, Pastimes and Livelihoods, was chosen to express Cunnington and his correspondence's occupations and interests whilst trying to fit with the period of the 19th century. Within her plan, Helen selected a number of objects from the museum's collections, including letters from letter book two, objects from the Bush Barrow excavation, and portraits from the art collection. It is hoped one day in the future, Helen's exhibition plan will become a reality, ideally in the museum's main temporary exhibition galleries. Alternatively, elements of it could be exhibited in the new display cases now in the museum's library or long room. Her plan was put together with this flexibility in mind. It would be great to display the letters, original excavation notes, the objects discovered and portraits of those involved all together in one place. The flexibility of the letters being stored as they are now means it sees it is easier to make this happen. We have also been watching, researching some of the 59 correspondents. Some we knew of already, but others we did not know at all, or we just knew of them. Not only did we want to find out who they were, but we also wanted to find out what their significance could be in connection to William Cunnington. This research is ongoing. So far, we have only researched 14, but I thought I would highlight a few here. As mentioned earlier, there were five correspondents in letter book one. I gave a brief overview of them at the beginning, and I'm sure some of them are familiar to you already, especially Sir Richard Cot Hall. All of these men have been researched, and some more so than others, but there is still more work to be done. As you can see from this list, some were prolific letter writers, whilst others less so. This is probably down to the relationship they had between each other. 
no doubt some were friends, some were acquaintances and employees, and the last, Sir Richard Colt Hall, was his employer and friend. Instead of talking about those who were quite well known, I thought I would share some of our research results about two men shown here because I find them interesting. Abraham, Abraham and Philip Crocker were father and son and are affectionately known as the Crockers. Abraham was a schoolmaster at Ilminster in Somerset before moving to Froome to be master of the Blue Coat School in 1738. With his sons, John, Philip, James and Edmund, he started a surveying business and by 1797 had, he had established a printing office in Froome and was printing posters, pamphlets and books. Known for being a surveyor, cartographer and printer, he was also an author. Abraham wrote The Elements of Land Surveying in 1814, designed principally for the use of schools and students. He also wrote books on cider making, measuring and valuing trees, Catechism of the Church of England, and an introduction to English grammar and rhetoric. He retired in 1815, leaving his sons John and James to continue with the printing business. The portrait of him here that you can see can be found in Froome uh, Town Council offices. Although he only wrote, fif wrote 15 letters to William Cunnington, these largely focus on archaeological matters, including excavations of two Roman villas at Pitt Mead near Warminster and thanking him for fossil specimens and loans of books. Now, Philip was Abraham's son. He was a surveyor and draftsman and assisted the Ordnance Survey in the production of the first one inch to one mile maps of Wiltshire. Wil Wiltshire. In 1807, he began surveying and drawing maps for Sir Richard Colt Hall. And these, along with his finds illustrations, were later included in Colt Hall's publication, Ancient Wiltshire. He left the Ordnance Survey in 1809 to become Colt Hall's steward at Stourhead and is described as his faithful servant for 30 years. He died in 1841 and is buried at Stourton. Philip's 48 letters to William Cunnington largely focus on archaeological matters, including what sites he is surveying, what work he is done in, doing for Colt Hall, and that he is collecting fossil specimens, presumably for Cunnington. Several letters mention my brother, which I am assuming was Edmund, Philip's younger brother, and who was a skilled artist and also worked for the Ordnance Survey as a surveyor. As I mentioned before, there are letters from 54 correspondents and letterbook too. Currently, many of the names are just names on a page to me, but hopefully they will come to life soon as we research them further. But this evening, I have selected five which I hope you will find interesting. Elima Bork Lambert was a botanist, antiquarian, geologist and author. He grew up at Boyton House near Hatesbury and from an early age was a collector and created a museum in his home at Boyton, which he continued with into his adult life. Lambert became an active member of several societies, most importantly, a member of the Linnean Society from 1788 until his death in 1842. The Linnean Society is the world's oldest active society founded in 1788 and concerns the study of nature, both botanical and zoological. Lambert was vice president of this society from 1796 until his death and is best known for his work identifying conifers. He was also a fellow of both the Royal Society and the Society of Antiqu Antiquities. Although his 50 letters to Cunnington were mostly concerning fossils and geological matters, Lambert did take an interest in Cun Cunnington's barrow digging, hiring Cun Cunnington for work on his estate in 1804. He also financed Cunnington between 1802 and 1804, the same way Richard Colt Hoare did later. Lambert was even recorded as present on the opening of one of the barrows in 1808, which suggests both the close relationship he had 
with William Cunnington and that he had an active interest in antiquity. The Reverend Edward Duke was born in Hungerford in 1779. He was ordained in 1802 and in 1805 he came into the family estates including Lake House at Wilsford cum Lake which had been in his family since 1578. Duke was an antiquarian and became interested in the prehistory and archaeology of Wiltshire, like much of the learned men of the time, and investigated many barrows within his estate. By 1807, Duke was a fellow of the Antiquarian Society, and in 1810 joined Lambert's Linnean Society, which shows how many of these men all moved in similar circles. All nine of Edward Duke's letters to Cunnington focus on the topic of antiquary. The letters show how interested Duke was in Cunnington's excavations, requesting on several occasions to be present for them. He also takes advice from Cunnington as to how to conduct some of his own excavations on what he refers to as my barrows. The artifacts he found were displayed in a museum within his house, much like most of the other men did at this time. And after his death, his displays briefly became an exhibition in his home at Lake House. After Cunnington's death in 1810, Duke lived for another 42 years, qualifying as a magistrate in 1816 and drawing up articles for the Gentleman's Magazine. Many articles discussed the relationship between Stonehenge and Druids, and picked up where previous antiquaries such as John Aubrey and William Stukeley had left off. Matthew Bolton was an English manufacturer, engineer, silversmith and business partner of Scottish engineer James Watt. Together they installed hundreds of Bolton and Watt steam engines which made possible the mechanisation of factories and mills. Bolton also applied modern techniques to minting coins and supplied up-to-date equipment to the Royal Mint. He was a founding member of the Lunar Society, a group of men from the Birmingham area who were prominent in the arts, sciences and theology. The society met each month near a full moon and had lively dinner conversations. These conversations are thought to have developed concepts in science, agriculture, manufacturing, mining, and transport and laid the groundwork for the Industrial Revolution. We may only have one letter from Bolton to Cunnington, which discusses coining dollars at his Soho manufactory in Birmingham. Maybe this is where Cunnington's idea to strike his own tokens came from. But I think the fact Cunnington is corresponding with a founding member of the Lunar Society is possibly more interesting because this contact could open up a whole new area of interest and connections to more like-minded people. William Smith started work as a surveyor in Oxfordshire and was soon traveling the country, working on mining, canal construction and irrigation projects. Through this work, he observed patterns in the layers of rocks and began making detailed notes on their formation and the fossils found within them. These notes led him to publishing the first detailed geology map of Great Britain in 1815, but it also led to his bankruptcy. Smith was never invited to become a fellow of the Geological Society, even though he is known as the father of English geology. In 1831, he was formally recognised for his accomplishments and discoveries and awarded the Wollaston Medal. His archive was left to the Oxford University Museum of Natural History by his nephew, John Phillips, in the late 19th century. Again, although we only have one letter from William Smith in this group of letters, he is mentioned in five others and highlights Cunnington's interest in geology. He's also the first person an external researcher has requested information about um, and who, and who also asked, did we have any letters from him since the book has been conserved? The researcher lived in Nottingham and was not sure when he would be next coming to Wiltshire. However, because the letters have now been digitised, I could send him the letter scans and he could continue with his research 
this is just one of the benefits of this project. And to the final correspondent I've chosen. Like William Cunnington, Reverend James Douglas started life as a cloth merchant. After becoming a military engineer, Douglas took great interest in the barrows he would disturb whilst making defensive earthworks in Kent. From these barrows, he collected many Saxon antiquities, which he then recorded. In 1783, James Douglas was appointed a fellow of the Society of Antiquaries, and soon after he began writing literature on antiquity. His major work, Nernia Britannica, was a history of Great Britain up until the conversion to Christianity. It disclosed the funeral customs of ancient Britons, was illustrated by himself, and used examples from barrows that he himself excavated. Upon his death in 1819, Sir Richard Cothall bought his collection, selling it to the Ashmolean Museum 10 years later, which is where it remains to this day. The, there are still many more correspondents to research, and I've only selected a few here, but hopefully this gives an idea of the gentleman Cunnington was corresponding with and the topics they were discussing. So what next? Well, now the collection is protected and more accessible, we have started creating a list of things to do or would like to do. We'd like to create a greater online presence and raise the awareness of the antiquarian collections we have within the museum. We also need to continue researching the correspondence. We want to research who knew who. By that I mean start making connections and find out what similar circles these men moved about in. We'd also like to research who belonged to which society, which obviously is linked to the last idea. For example, who was a fellow of the Society of Antiquaries, which was founded in 1707 to encourage, advance and further the study and knowledge of the antiquities and history of this and other countries. So far, we have discovered that Cunnington, John Britton, A.B. Lambert, Reverend Edward Duke and Redwood, Reverend James Douglas were all fellows. We'd also like to research some of the themes which are appearing as we research the letters further. For example, how many correspondents talk about collecting fossils and exchanging specimens, presumably to create their own museums? And also, how did they go about swapping them? Did they drop them off at a pub and collect them on the way? Or we don't know. We'd also like to create an exhibition or temporary displays about the correspondence and create a list of potential research projects uh, for MA and uh, PhD um, students and then discuss with relevant university departments. And the last thing I'd like to say is thank you. There are, there are many people who I'd like to thank and who have helped us with these letter books. The funders, AIM, Pilgrim Trust, National Manuscripts Conservation Trust, and museum members. Without their support, the letter books would not have been conserved and protected for future generations to enjoy. Also, I should thank everyone else who worked on the project. Sandy Haynes, an ar archive and library volunteer and a retired archivist. She has been cataloguing the museum's antiquarian collections for over 10 years. And she first told me about the letter books. Helen Meekle, the MA student from Bath Spa University, our conservators, Tom and Rex Lancefield from Lancefield Conservation, David and the other members of staff at the museum, including Lisa, the museum's curator, and Rachel, the museum's development officer, and obviously our archive and library volunteers who have helped do some of the research along the way. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jane. Absolutely fascinating. I've got a. Uh, I can get in first. Uh, don't forget, if you want to ask a question, if you click on the Q and A button, you can then type in your question. Um, but I've got one to go to go first, which is, <laughs> can you tell us what Helen's up to now? Because um, she did a fantastic job on this project, didn't she? She did. Yeah, she was amazing. Um, 
she wasn't sure if she wanted to do archive work, but now she definitely does. Um, so when she finished university, um, she was desperately trying to find a job. And at the moment she is um, doing archival work for um, law courts in um, Bristol, I think. Um, but so she's still using her archival skills um, and she's also having to do transcriptions of some court cases. But ideally, she wants to come back into archives um, because she's realised that she that's what she wants to do. So we didn't manage to put her off. No. <laughs> most, most remiss of us. <laughs> that's fantastic. OK, and we've got a question here from Chris saying, uh, thank you, James, really illuminating, especially about the process of conservation. Uh, result is a physical medium we have to visit to see see it though we uh, appreciate it's digitized while modes has a summary of the content is there a plan to expand expand extend this to transcription with a view to a separate publication especially given the difficulty in reading script oh well um possibly um <laughs> we we have there were um, a number of letters that helen transcribed um, while she was doing her MA, um, because obviously she needed to know what the content was in order to um, see if they were relevant or not. Um, all the letters have got a very basic summary of them. Um, but yeah, I would say, like you say, the, the script is difficult to read. Um, and in an ideal world, yes, we would have transcriptions of a full transcription of every letter. Um, so um, it's the case of getting your eye in when you're trying to read it. Um, and once that happens, then it's a bit easier, but it can take time. Um, but looking at the letters, you, you begin to recognize letters by the same person, the handwriting, you, you can see the consistencies and you, you recognize um, uh, some of the letters and some of the words that are written in a certain way. Um, we yeah somehow there will be I would say I would hope a full transcription of all these letters in the future how that would be um, uh, put into the public domain I don't know yet haven't thought that far yeah Alan uh, has commented um, he thinks Chris is right the letters make a great anthology well I think some of them might some of them are quite boring though I think which is question I'd like to ask which is what what sort of what struck you and or Helen as sort of being things that were real gems in the correspondence um I possibly because of my parents background in terms of their careers I found them discussing all their ailments quite interesting <laughs> they all seem to be complaining about one thing or another or so and so's had a bout of this and um so I found that quite interesting. I don't know what that says about me. Um, Helen um, found the ideas that they moved in similar circles or they were trying to get make contact with other people to um, ask questions. And she particularly um, was interested in this idea of making a moss house. So this is like um, a little a little house in a garden which is covered in moss and that's where you display your geological specimens. So apparently Cunnington had one um, and that's about as much as I know. Um, Sandy, um, who has been cut along the collections, knows far more. And I know there is a book about moss houses, but it's almost as if these gentlemen were all sort of trying to maybe copy each other or try and have a little bit of everything so yeah <laughs> I think they're trying to outdo each other if nothing else yeah know? and I find it fascinating that uh, sort of Duke for example was desperate he was clearly desperate to be at Cunnington's excavations to see what he was doing and that sort of so it wasn't just spirit of inquiry it was also you know keep keeping an eye on what your uh, what the opposition was up to a bit like what some archaeologists do today, I suppose. How dare you suggest such a thing? 
Okay. Um, and from Leslie, uh, she's her, she put in a very interesting discussion presentation. I'm interested in the process of preservation because of her interest in Reverend uh, Jackson's Hungerford papers. Um, these are more voluminous and perhaps of less general interest. Oh, I don't know about that. I would say everything's got a, it's important in its own way. I mean, yes, the Jackson papers, yes, they are, there are lots and lots of those. Um, they've, there's a base, we've had, a, we've got a basic catalogue of them, um, but the way in which they are within the collection wasn't in the same condition as these, which is why they haven't been um, uh, sort of put to the priority list. Um, because all of these antiquarian um, papers and documents and things are on acidic paper, this is possibly something that will have to be looked at over time. And it's a case of prioritizing which ones need to be dealt with um, as you go along, really. Um, but yeah, um, most, most due to the nature of them are tatty around the edges and people with best intentions have tried to repair them in the past. And um, today we know that repairing something with sellotape is not the best. Um, but, but I, I think also there is some interest in having the Hungerford papers digitised, but we're sort of dis just discussing that at the moment because it's quite be, it will be quite a task. Um, it will, yeah. There's a lot yeah. of them. <laughs> <laughs> a lot, lot, a lot, lot more of them. Yeah. And Hazel has just asked, was there any mention or correspondence with women? Oh, I knew someone was going to ask that. Um, there are only uh, three letters from women, um, I think, uh, two of which uh, is the wife of um, uh, William Martin, who um, Cunnington had been corresponding with. Um, William sadly died and must have written a letter to his widow um, because she writes two letters to him thanking for his kind um, words, kind wishes. Um, and then the other one, it was, uh, I can't remember her name, Lady something, um, but it's, it's not within the same... Um, sort of I suppose, academic world, the content of the letter is, is, is a bit different. So I wonder whether it was maybe sort of like um, a request to uh, organise transport or to stay somewhere. Um, I can't remember her name off the top of my head, I'm sorry. But yeah, I, I was disappointed that, but at the same time, not surprised that there are so few letters from women. And nothing from Ethelred Bennett, I hope. Well, not I hope, it would be great if there were. She she had an amazing story, very early geologist who, um, um, one of the, she had a, a name that was slightly unfamiliar, shall we say, and she got an award from the Russian Tsar because he hadn't realized that she was a female. She had done amazing work on um, uh, uh, cataloging uh, fossil sponges, which and uh, sort of identifying a whole set of type series. Yeah. I'll have to. I will go through all the letters again. But yeah, so sadly, sadly uh, not. Sadly not. No. <laughs> and the other thing, just to add, is that the Cunnington family. Um, retain their interest in both archaeology and geology. William Cunnington III in particular being fascinated by geology and he um, made an important collection, much of which he gave to the uh, the Natural History Museum, but some of which we have too, including the, um, the slices of stone, uh, the stones of Stonehenge that we uh, <laughs> refound in the loft recently. And uh, 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 Rob Ixer and Co have been looking at. So it's fascinating to see that sort of family, that family life. And um, Chris has said, um, as a very amateur person, I think we're all amateurs, aren't we? Um, can a non recognized researcher gain access to the letters purely for aesthetic reasons? 
Let's see why not. Your curiosity. <laughs> um, it would it would be uh, handy if you are researching a specific thing, but I can't. Um, there would be no reason why you couldn't um, come and have a look at them. They are the the new uh, binders are quite hefty, um, but uh, um, I'm sure that yeah we could um, make an arrangements for that. All you've got to do is just. Um, drop me an email and we can arrange a visit. And Helen said, uh, you mentioned keywords are in the database, so presumably it's possible to search by site. Yes. Yep. Yep. So places which are mentioned, um, uh, there's a places field within each record, um, and yet people mentioned um, topics like geology, excavation, human burial, um, artifacts, that sort of thing um because when you're cataloging something you're trying to think how people want to get the information out and what sort of questions people would ask so um obvious one is uh it is yeah is who spoke who corresponded about geology so if that topic comes up so mention of fossils and things if that comes up in the letters then that would be one of the keywords to go in yeah so as i say when you're cataloging you're trying to think how people what, questions people are answering and and can i say i was um chatting to alan who's on the call who was asking about a particular site and i was went through modes and found it sorry to disappoint you all but um, i don't think the the added these added records have been uploaded to our online database yet so th those will be going live when we next do a bulk upload but uh so 500 odd records to add yay <laughs> And pictures of the, most of the letters as well, which will be fabulous. So something to look forward to. Okay, so unless there's any more quick questions, I think we'll call it a day there. It's been absolutely fascinating. I, I love the picture of the, um, the Ushabti. Obviously, uh, obviously discussing non-British, well, some non-British uh, uh, finds, although the, uh, the melon beads could well be British um so very big thank you to jane uh for her a fascinating talk thank you for everyone for coming and we look forward to seeing you again at a call uh, again in the near future and hopefully to seeing the letter books on display so thanks everyone good night thanks Hi Jane. Hi yeah. Yeah. Is that, was that okay? <laughs> That's brilliant. Right, everyone's gone. <laughs> or being kicked off. <laughs> that was really interesting. No, per absolutely perfect. Good. Yeah. That's a relief. Oh, oh, oh. I forgot to